be able to, um, you know, you maybe you'll want to add something later. Yeah, Laura, you just, that is a good opening um, by just um, pointing to this one thing that, that I think is true for everybody. The moment you find another being and you start the conversation about the moment you, you step into this APN, what we can call the APN field, mm -hmm. it, you just never want to stop. I mean, it, it, yeah, you wish for it, for it never to end. Um, and it's almost as if, as long as we can um, uh, allow some, some openness that we, we have this tremendous opportunity to learn from each other. And also together, it seems as if we can discover things we didn't even know before, none of us. But um, just like bees do too, um, this, this, uh, the wisdom of gathering really this, what some people call the tissue-like gathering of people um, awakens just another awareness and consciousness. And Laura, you and, you and I, we have been enjoying those conversations for quite some time. And, and like Laura said, we thought, why don't we just mark this day as just a unique day within 365 days of Earth Day a year um, and invite our others to join and um, share story, share heart, share soul, share being. And I'd like to just do a little business. Um, I'd like to invite you to mute the microphone. And if you haven't done that before, you, um, you put your cursor on your picture and um, it'll show up, the little blue button will show up in the top and it'll say mute. And if you do that, then we won't have different doors shutting and people can be talking to you and it won't disturb the class or the uh, group, the conversation. I was really excited to do this, Mikhail, because for me, um, for me, the bees themselves are this huge daily prayer in my life. The, for me, I see the bees that live in my yard, which now they moved in the other day, a swarm just moved into a box into my bee shed. And, uh, I'm so honored that they chose to chose me to live with them. It's the first time that's ever happened in my long time beekeeping, but, um, the, that, that what they do in life, all buzzing insects, all pollinating insects, is just meditate on creation. They're like this constant prayer mm. of creation. Um, that's all they think about, that's all they do. And in my perspective, mm. in how I've learned from bees, they consider themselves this really integral part of nature, that they're so involved with their mm. landscape that they don't see themselves as separate, that they see that the that the family of flowers that they live with, that they're responsible for them and that they are, exist because of them. Just like they're a super organism within their own body, they're also a super organism within the planet. So, so and in their landscape, their biome. So for me, meeting them um, is really touching into the prayer of hope and the future. And this spring with our little sweet air break we are having perhaps a healthy, mm -hmm. healthy resurgence of, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping this will give some insects a little boost um, right now and maybe pull some back from the brink. Um, I'd like to see the monarch this year. But anyway, that's why I'm, I'm excited about um, meeting Earth Day with the bees, um, almost to say um, to that ambassador, thank you, you know, to have that gratitude today. That's so beautiful how you play, you put it, Laura, to say really uh, in, in the end, um, bees are just a, um, an endless prayer, an endless prayer for life. And, um, and maybe we could also see it as, and this um, endless vow to serve, this, this endless gesture of service and um you know what else what strikes me lately is how humble this being is so humble and um <clears throat> and this humbleness made me think of that story 
this creation story. And I wonder, Laura, whether you would still be up for yeah. uh, reading the story. Yes. Would you? Yes, yes, yes. So the own so Laura and I, we have we we really are very we have no idea how this will all take shape today. But the only thing we thought was to read the creation story with as it is printed and um, told by Robin Wall Kimmerer in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. And um, it is a very short story and I don't wanna say too much before it, but maybe we can talk afterwards about how it really relates to the AP and being and to our, to our lives. And Laura, we could just take turns, one paragraph. Of, yeah, you wanna do that? Perfect. Okay, would you like to start? Certainly. In the beginning, there was the sky world. Your paragraph? <clears throat> she fell like a maple seed, pirouetting on an autumn breeze. A column of light streamed from a hole in the sky world, marking her path where only darkness had been before. It took her a long time to fall. In fear, or maybe hope, she clutched a bundle tightly in her hand. Hurtling downward, she saw only dark water below, but in that emptiness, there were many eyes gazing up at the sudden shaft of light. They saw there a small object, a mere dust mote in the beam. As it grew closer, they could see that it was a woman, arms outstretched, long black hair billowing behind as she spiraled toward them. The geese nodded at one, at one another and rose to gather the water in a wave of goose music. She felt the beat of their wings as they flew beneath the break her fall, to break her fall. Far from the only home she had ever known, she caught her breath at the warm embrace of soft feathers as they gently carried her downward. And so it began. The geese could not hold the woman above the water for much longer, so they called the council to decide what to do. Resting on the wings, she saw them all gather, loons, otters, swans, beavers, fish of all kinds. A great turtle floated in the midst and offered his back for her to rest upon. Gratefully, she stepped from the goose wings onto the dome of a shell. The others understood that she needed land for her home and discussed how they might serve her need. The deep divers among them had heard of mud at the bottom of the water and agreed to go find some. Loon dove first, but the distance was too far and after a long while, he surfaced with nothing to show for his efforts. One by one, the other animals offered to help otter, beaver, sturgeon, but the depth, the darkness, and the pressure were too great for even the strongest of swimmers. They returned gasping for air with their heads ringing. Some did not return at all. Soon, only little muskrat was left. The weakest diver of all, he volunteered to go while the others looked on doubtfully. His small legs flailed as he worked his way downward, and he was gone a very long time. They waited and waited for him to return, fearing the worst for their relative. And before long, a stream of bubbles rose with a small limp body of the muskrat. He had given his life to aid this helpless human. But then the others noticed that his paw was tightly clenched and when they opened it, there was a small handful of mud. Turtle said, here, put it on my back and I will hold it. 
Sky Woman bent and spread the mud with her hands across the shell of the turtle. Moved by the extraordinary gifts of the animals, she sang in thanksgiving and then began to dance, her feet caressing the earth. The land grew and grew as she danced her thanks, from the dab of mud on turtle's back until the whole earth was made, not by Sky Woman alone, but from the alchemy of all the animals' gifts coupled with her deep gratitude. Together they formed what we know today as Turtle Island, our home. Like any good guest, Sky Woman had not come empty-handed. The bundle was still clutched in her hand. When she toppled from the hole in the sky world, she had reached out to grab onto the tree of life that grew there. In her grasp were branches, fruits, and seeds of all kinds of plants. These she scattered onto the new ground and carefully tended each one until until the world turned from brown to green. Sunlight streamed through the hole from the sky world, allowing the seeds to flourish. Wild grasses, flowers, trees, bees, and medicines spread everywhere. And now that the animals too had plenty to eat, many came to live with her on Turtle Island. So this is this beautiful, beautiful story of creation, which when I heard it the first time, I had to weep because it's so touching. And and every time I read it, I read something new. I, I hear something new. But these days, and maybe we can talk a little bit about this, these days, what strikes me so deeply is how it also can be read as a story about the APN being in all aspects, in the creation aspects, in the service, in you know, the relative, the muskrat as a relative, everybody, all my relations. And, and um, giving oneself for the benefit of the greater whole, as all of them do, uh, in particular, the weakest link, the muskrat. The muskrat being so humble to the extent that the muskrat is dedicating his, her life to the survival of another being. And I think in a joyful way, in a happy way, with a clarity of heart, which makes it the own into the only possible choice almost as if it's it's not it's not even this making a decision whether or not to give one's life but as if there was no other choice to be the most truthful to life may well mean to fully give one's life. What this is making me think of is because of the music in the background, that the being of the bee is almost like musical notes in an orchestra, that, that you can't have the orchestra without the music, but there's this quality that they're just threading through the world. Um, and that's the sacredness about it is that it's the vibration, the music, the, um, the movement, uh, the laying of lines, the pollination, the creative aspect, the commitment to the solar uh, cycle on the planet, that it's without it, there's no music. You can have all the instruments lined up, 
but you couldn't have the music of creation without the bee strumming through that. And um, for me, the concept of sacred, is like, you know, everything is sacred, really. But to me, what is sacred is the principle, like you're talking about the service to the whole, where it wouldn't even be considered giving it one's life, it would be living one's life in the full expression of the music of being in that place and doing your job and doing your part, no more, no less, that just the vibration of working toward the common good of all creation yeah. is the music that sort of makes this whole thing beautiful, you know, yeah. and it's true in science too, because we all know about vibrations and, you know, these, you know, the way that everything's communicating through magnetism and movement and, you know, air, but, um, yeah, so that, that drew me in, into that, that the act of giving one's life is simply, especially the bee teaches us, is the act of living life. That there is no even, it's just serving it until the, in the utmost best way you can until you're done. So, so true. So, so true. And um, it just, I don't know about you, but I, it just made me wonder you know, what would I do in this, in this situation, the musket found herself. And um, it is just such a, such a powerful medicine for the soul to kind of reattune herself, himself, to some, to a, to a greater truth. And the same is with bees bees have this capacity of of radiating into our hearts and touching our hearts in, in such a non-verbal way uh, we cannot help ourselves but feel it and and fall for it because that's maybe where we are similar with the with the musket where there are moments where we have no choice but it is so it's not about um, enticement to be in the presence of bees and fall into this sacred heart, but there is no other choice. It is, it is by um, not resisting almost and surrendering, giving over like the musket did too in a different way to give over, to surrender to this presence, to this stream or like you call it the music to become music um, without um, deciding to it uh, for it really because it is so it is like breathing it's like I don't decide to breathe in it's the, to make inhalation into a matter of whether I like it or not or whether I think it makes sense or whether it's it fits my personal preferences is so it doesn't make sense and so with being with bees it it's almost as if those um, that a lot of dichotomies fall up hard fall away and we are falling into something beyond i love that and i know some of the people on this and i know personally that several of the folks here have been really just drawn into bees through a calling, not, you know, something like external or something internal, something so deep that they walk towards bees and need to know everything about bees for some reason. And I would like to wager to say that the bees have chosen each of you to become a human spokesperson for them, to, to listen to them and help um, support them in the world, to be an ambassador for them. Um, and that that's why you're being drawn into this conversation of all the things you could do on Earth Day. Um, so that, that and what does that mean? You know, maybe that means that our voice gets added to their song or that we get sung about by them. Even the simple act of sitting with the bees brings your perfume into the colony. Well, maybe also sitting with the bees brings the perfume of Earth into our musical 
way of approaching the world. And it sounds all esoteric, but I don't think it's esoteric at all. I think it is as simple as listening to music and learning how to play your own instrument. You know, and sometimes you might feel like, dun, 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 like maybe I don't sound like, <laughs> but, but then, you know, one day you're actually singing a tune in tune or you're getting a riff that you didn't know that's what they could say to you. You know, it's, um, it's a birthright and bees in particular for European, um, uh, honeybees for Europeans, melopona for Mesoamericans, these are native species for our ancestors to learn about the sacred. That listening to them, literally science has shown us that if we listen to them, we, our brainwaves change. And all of you that do live with bees know that we've been changed by them and that they're transformative and that the transformation goes beyond the bees. Um, into a greater understanding of Gaian consciousness or uh, your own uh, psychology or relationship with animism. You know, I believe that they're like a trumpeteer for animism. That's that everything, every life has consciousness, you know. Um, I don't know. That was just a riff. That was me just going. Me, 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 me. Yeah, that's, <laughs> no, that's so beautiful. What did you say? You said they're an ambassador for animism to... Yeah. Yeah, and that rings so true, Laura. This, um, um, I mean, bees are this extra, the, it, they're, you know, poison and medicine, and um, they're really this very potent medicine. It's, it's similar to um, monastic vows. The moment you take a vow, that vow will then transform your life and not only that but uh it would it will lead to possibly the deconstruction of of many things you initially cherish about who you think you are it's and bees have this power and it's a it's not the right word for that um they have this by being exposed by their being it, it is as if we stand in front of a mirror but what we see is not the usual reflection the regular the normal mirror just reflects our projections and our wishes and our constructions of who we think we are but when we stand in front of bees and it, when we stand in front of the apian mirror we really see uh, the soul and it is dis disarming it is it can be disorienting because it takes away our regular re reference range we if we are brave enough, we'll end up swimming in, in something where there's nothing to hold on to. It's as if we are leaving, it's like a journey, going on a journey, leaving the body uh, behind and um, just moving into a different kind of reality. And that's, I think, what, what comes up for me when I listen to you. It's by stepping in front of, into this apian mirror, we are stepping into different worlds. And that in turn shifts the way we, we view the world. And all of a sudden there is no other. And all of a sudden we so clearly can see the lifeness and the soul quality of all there is, including stones and stardust. So it's dangerous. I mean, you have to, we have to be, you know, you have to be, are you, are you ready for this? <laughs> no, what you just described was the shamanic journey. <laughs> I mean, that is the exact, the Joseph Campbell description of the shamanic journey. And I had every flavor of everything you said. And I, and I see Carlisle did too, that you see that answer, that, that 
just from being with bees. It's not even going anywhere or going to the jungles. And, you know, it's like just being with bees is that kind of entrancement, which I believe is a normal way of living on the planet. That, that that's normal, that everything, every disconnect that we have away from that is abnormal, that it's really normal to have that uh, relationship with nature. And it's just a matter of tuning in. I don't know how much time you wanted us to riff, but I would love to, to see if there's anybody that, um, uh, are you, are you ready, Mike, uh, Mikhail, to open it a little bit, see if anybody's excited, yeah? Absolutely. Does anybody have some kind of like, excitement around this topic or feedback or a way that you feel that expression in your life? Oh, unmute yourself, babe. This is one of the best topics that's ever entered my life. And um, just for y'all that don't know me, I'm 62 and 22 years ago, I was in an art show and there was a woman that did a project with bees and I went to look at the project and listen to the project and I went to a super deep meditation and my heart blew open when I came out of it and I heard, you're gonna have bees. And then eight years later, I built a house and I had bee and, and then a few years later, I started keeping bees. <clears throat> and I went from a classic Langstroth with black Pirco to at this point, I don't have any bees, they, they absconded. I went to what frameless, I mean, what foundationless frames, the whole nine yards, because I studied with Laura and I studied with Mikael and it's just been fantastic. So even without having the hive, it is truly something that is mm. incredibly heart opening for me. And, and Mikael, as you all, as you were talking about the muskrat, what was coming up for me was, in the Bhagavad Gita, there's this beautiful passage, which is this epic Indian poem, when Arjuna, who's of this family, is on the battlefield, and he's got to fight his cousins. He's got to kill the demons, but he's also got to kill his cousins. And he doesn't want to, and he's really anxious. And Krishna, Lord Krishna, comes down and gives him a pep talk, basically, and talks to him about his dharma. And so as you talked about the muskrat, I've always felt that the bees are doing their dharma and they do it the most. So here's Arjuna getting this pep talk that he's got to go out and deliver the sting, even if people are going to die from, him, even if his cousins are going to die, but he's following the dharma. And so I feel like the path, the apian being is a beautiful example of following dharma. And it is really a beautiful illustration for me in how to follow my own dharma and how to be a citizen of the world dharmically. <clears throat> I love that. Yeah, that's beautiful. It is, it is a dharma gate. You know, in Mahayana Buddhism, it's, there's a, a phrase, it's called, it, sa it says, Dharma gates are boundless, and that is one of them. The APN is a gate, um, and I think, yeah, and that's, I, I, yeah. that's such a so. powerful metaphor, too. Because isn't that, isn't that battle uh, the one where they call on the goddess and she? You know, or is that the battle where, you know, maybe there's different, oh, there's different tellings. There's different tellings. There's uh, of different battles. Yeah. I was thinking of another one, the, the story of where they, um, the, the, the Shakambari is, is a goddess that manifests after the world has fallen into, um, the demons have stolen all the holy books of knowledge and uh, were actually gifted the holy books of knowledge and they took them and they kept them to themselves and they didn't let anybody else have them. And so then all the people forgot how to say thank you to the gods. They forgot the names of the goddesses. They forgot how to do all the proper rituals. And then the world just, uh, you know, the rivers were burning and the uh, oceans were heaving back and the land was cracking open. Basically what's happening in the world 
you know, today. And so the people called on the most powerful um, God of them all, and that they called on the mother goddess to help bring the world back into balance. And depending on the version of what happens, she turns herself into um, a billion stinging insects and ends up getting rid of all the demons on earth. But what to me that is saying is that, um, that, that for the, it, by calling on that through the bees, we can call on the forces of earth to, um, by helping promote the bee and talk about the bee and give thanks to the bee and recognize who she is on the earth, we can bring forward that goddess to help repair the planet, you know, just the, whether it's in ourselves, in our immune mm -hmm. systems, or in our social systems that, um, and what really it's like Arjuna, that's what reminded me, Carlisle, was the crying that you have to kill not only the demons, but your cousins, you know, the people that are on the other side that, you know, that there has to be some, ow, you know, this is, this hurts. There's this shift, you know? Um, so that's what the story reminded me of that, of that gathering forces together to really pull up the energy of the earth so that we can withstand what's happening. Um, in the world, environmentally is what I'm speaking of, really. Um, so I do believe that calling forth the bees does bring forth understanding. And people understand, if you bring forth the bees, they understand, oh, GMOs are bad, or glyphosate's bad, or climate change is hurting things, you know? So the bee is bringing us truth and is getting rid of the false, um, you know, uh, beliefs that you need glyphosate to clean your yard or whatever. So um, I don't know, there's just another little riff, but um, Patricia, were you coming on camera because you wanted to say something? You always have such lovely things. <laughs> yeah, thank you both for doing this. I think when I spoke earlier, my mic was off and I was trying to figure out how to do this from my phone, but um, I'm so grateful to have this moment to connect with all of you and, and for both of you to talk because I, I always enjoy it so much. It's so beautiful. And I was thinking as you were sharing this, and the, the, the hero's journey of the experience with bees. And I just wanted to share about a little bit of how that was for me, because I feel like in the hero's journey is like this, for me in my life, it's been uh, dealing with endometriosis, which is you know, reproductive health, a condition that it's mostly caused because of environmental conditions and it's causing a lot of the infertility in the world with women um, it's horrible, agonizing, painful. Um, dealt with that since I was 18. And bees were sort of the um, helping, the helping spirits that came and helped me and have healed me. I'm not in pain anymore. I'm not going to the emergency room in agonizing pain since I've had the medicine. And so at that moment, I feel like it was one of those moments where I went from just the, you know, keeping bees in my garden like more like a hobby to a a deeper commitment a deeper like spiritual like okay we're doing this we're healing you and you are going to be a voice for us I felt like the bees were really asking me to step it in to a deeper um commitment and it's been amazing life transformation and I'm so grateful for bees and how they have changed my life in so many ways and all of the people that I meet through these like you beautiful people and like I just feel like my life is so much richer because of that connection with them because you're breaking up you're breaking up a little bit, Patricia. Maybe you're back now. We missed no, you I... a lot. The, yeah, we, we missed the last three sentences. Oh, just, you know, that I'm so grateful to be alive and have yeah. peace in my life and to have you in my life. Thank you. Yeah. Re Patricia, may, if I may ask you, um, if you would close your eyes and allow your heart to show you 
what the beast brought to your life, what would that be? What would that look like? Joy. Oh. It definitely is a joy and a calmness. Oh, it, it was, it just was so clear. Mm. Yeah, it's so beautiful. That's very beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's interesting, um, Joy. Um, and it reminded me of the Melissa plant, the, you know, mm. the one that they call Melissa, which means honeybee. And it is a nervous system calm. Uh, it calms your nervous system if you have that sweet lemon balm. If you have that in a cup of tea, that's a good calming um, um, mug. And then also, it smells like the queen pheromone. I'm sure you all know that. But, uh, you know, so it's sort of a, just reminded me what you were saying that almost like the millet, the tea can be a little bit of the honeybee medicine in your cup, you know, because mm -hmm. it's a same sort of nervous system. Thing. And I, I agree with you for me as well, joy and, and calmness. And also this year, because I didn't have bees this winter, the swarm that moved into my house felt like a part of my body coming back to me. You know, it's like mm. the relationship that I have with them has become so symbiotic psychologically that, um, that when they were gone, it was like, I didn't have a queen, you know, almost. So when they came back it was like, ah, everything became right sized again. But, um, and, and I want to really honor that this is a fragile time. We, Kyle and I talked about this at the, that what's going on in the world is very painful. Uh, the insect apocalypse is a real thing. Um, and um, really that to, to feel like it's a, such a gift that they came back, it used to be normal that they came back. It used to be that there was no problem. They always came back. And so to know that we're having that feeling now really means to doubly honor them. Because really, um, it's a, Mikhail and I were talking about this yesterday, it's a luxury. Um, it's a, it's right now, it's a extravagant gift. And so the more we really honor that gratitude, I know it makes a difference. I know it makes a difference in, with the bees. There were two hives here one year. One was over there. I had uh, three of mine and one was Carla's and Carla's. This hive and that hive were the same parent hive. Well, that one I didn't pray over. I was messing around more bonding with the other hives. And Carla prayed over this one. That one just grew and grew and grew, you know? I, I, and not, it's not a scientific experiment by any stretch of the imagination, but I witnessed what can be done that all of the other hives from those uh, parents, they were rescue hives, they all died. The one that was prayed over, specifically prayed over, kept thriving. So the more prayers we give to these beings of gratitude, and that's all we have to do is say thank you. There's nothing fancy. There's no mantra. There's no state of mind we have to be in. But just this moment of us saying thank you for their presence, all and through the bees, all pollinators, um, I think can really help them a lot because they 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 know that we see them. They, they evolved with us and they, it's like my chickens, they do better, or at least they seem to be having more fun when we make eye contact and do stuff together. Why wouldn't the bees be the same way? Yeah, you know, that's so true, Laura. And maybe we could, you said, they know we see them. And I often wonder whether we know that we are being seen as well. And, um, and that brings me to something which has to do with all of us. Um, we are meeting currently on Zoom in this way and as if it accentuates something which has been uh, there already before which is that 
there is often this temptation to think that one is alone, that one is um, uh, separate from others. And <clears throat> Earth Day, we can also understand as Mother's Day, right? This is about mother and and mother everywhere, mother within, mother without, and all together as mother. It's Mother's Day. Um, and in the Apian context, it just is for us, for this kind of, for, it is such an opportunity to reconnect with home. Uh, despite the fact that we all right now are sitting where we are, we are connecting through Zoom. Um, and, you know, there, there are a lot of people out there who are unable to, to experience touch right now because of where we live. Um, and that's what I mean. It, it just accentuates this even more so, this belief of being separate when in fact, we all know it from our experience from the apian field that it's an it's illusionary thinking and that um meeting right now now with all of you on zoom is also an expression of homecoming of acknowledging that we all are uh, one family that we all are relatives and that we belong and that we need each other because we together are constituting something much larger. And with just one of us not there, everything is different. And that's such a beautiful thing to remember on Day and Mother's Day um, that these are this Dharma gate Kara was talking about which allows us to see that, how intimately we are all connected to each other, to think it's such a funny thing we do to have the sensation of feeling lonely and disconnected. And I think we all know this feeling. And just, just it is a, you know, Laura, you called it the luxury of, swarms coming back into our life in spring and yes and um now i lost the train of thought i wanted to get somewhere anyway i said enough you know what i mean it's and and to hold this um with warmth and our heart and to allow this to sink into our hearts this reality that we are so intimately interconnected you don't exist we don't exist without the other. We are really made through others. I think that I love that. Um, and I want to circle back to the concept of service. Um, because it is in service that we are completing the loop. And um, that, you know, just being a beekeeper, um, you know, it's not a, just about getting all up in the skirts, you know, and having the experience of being with the bees. It's about serving the entire structure of the relationship, um, whether it's forage or activism or our behavior when we're around the colony, asking for consent with the bees, um, acknowledging them with their own sentience, acknowledging them with their own duties and, and uh, schedule and, um, and that they have their own, their, their own being. And what I really wanted to say was if the bees can hear me right now, I'd like to say, to say thank you to, mama gaia because i realized that everybody where in the world that knows about earth day that they're basically practicing a feast day or a special sacred day for the planet and scientists don't mind calling other planets by their sacred names mars gets to be called mars venus gets to be called venus but no one likes to call Earth or by her name, but it's really Gaia's feast day today. So 
how wonderful that in a sense we are being um, by honoring this Earth Day and really talking about how we can take care of her. We're we're creating her feast. We're giving back to the planet on a day like today. And um, so I just you know I don't know I I kind of like that vibe that maybe millions upon millions, maybe even a couple hundred million people know it's Earth Day today, you know, and maybe more than that, maybe a couple billion, and uh, we're, they're all channeling their love um, and concern to the planet. So I'd like us to hop on that uh, electrical bandwagon and just like, you know, give that a little buzz. I think it's a rarefied thing to have to be drawn into the bees the way many of us are and such as to understand the ineffable sacred language that's there. But I want to say we're really lucky, you know, we're really lucky um, because it's a straight shot. I, I don't think there's an easier way to understand for uh, at least for the Western culture for to understand animals than to get to know the bee. Um, they're they're there for us. They're unlocking key after key after key of answers for us. Uh, if you have a question, what's good for the bee is good for humanity. You know, there you go. If it's good for the bee, it's good for people. So I think that's kind of a good restructuring concept for after the fall. Um, you know, spring when our society comes back, maybe people start to ask that question a little more. Is it good for bees? Well, then it's good for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> so there is no end to the conversation, but it all goes right back down to the center of the lemnus gate, you know, that the pollinator is here to create life on earth in act of pure service. And that in essence is what the planet is also doing and also could be a model for how we could serve as well. Hmm. And it's not like the, the way of like sacrifice, like I have to serve until my fingers bleed. It's about the joy and the beauty and the muses and the celebration, the gratitude, um, the dances that we do to have that joy expressed through our own bodies to be part of nature. Um, it's, not a, it's not toiling, it's enjoying and feeding the system both honoring the beauty that's being given to us as well as completely offering gratitude um, back to bring that full circle. Hmm. That's where I feel. What about some of our guys that are out there that are watching here? We have Tiago and Jacob. I don't know if either of you has moved to speak i think jacob's either going to block his camera or unmute his mic <laughs> I don't know. there you go hi laura <laughs> so you haven't met me yet but i'm sabrina's husband oh wow hello yeah so i'm just uh you know i've, I've been killing bees for four years i'm hoping to not kill them this year <laughs> <laughs> So I'm, I'm I'm hoping to get one hive to make it through the winter. I haven't haven't made it so far. Mm -hmm. That's tough. It all depends on their genetics. Yeah. Well, each each year I do something wrong. Uh -huh. So, but I'm learning. I haven't made the same mistake twice. <laughs> you should come visit our school. How, do you know Mikhail's work? I don't. No. Um, Mikhail, why don't you let um. Jacob and maybe a couple other people that may not know your work, tell us about the, what you're doing with bees. Well, um, first of all, I want to say something which, which you, Jacob, brought up in terms of um, feeling personally accountable and responsible for the death of this animal. And I think um, I know what you mean, and I think we all know what you mean, because we all were there or sometimes still are there. But sometimes I do wonder whether, I don't know, 
if it rains tomorrow and it's not a good time for rain to come, I would not judge myself for that. And I'm saying it this way because so many things do not apply to what we call honeybees. It is, there is a level of complexity and interwovenness present, which goes so far beyond what you, Jacob, or I, as Michael, are doing or not doing in the context of honeybees. Um, you know what I mean? So I just want to share that. Um, especially in, most of us are pro probably grew up within a Christian culture, and I think that feeds, there's something which feeds to the into that too. But anyway, more to say. But um, we have only a moment left. I think when Laura, when you ask, what are you doing with these? I think the short answer is, I'm trying to do as, as, as nothing as possible. So the word management has fallen out of the vocabulary of my world in this context. And what I'm hoping, uh, to embrace is a natural nest habitat, or one could say, I'm trying to uh, rehabilitate uh, the, the indigenous apian nest. I'm hoping to mimic that what has been um, represented in the wider embodiment of this life form for millions of years that um, and on all levels that trees have had and still to this day have holding and caring the apian being in their own womb under their own heart and that as and and li apian life was mostly uh, experienced throughout this arboreal companionship. Um, and Laura brought up the animism, and here I would link to it again and say, mm, just imagine to be this apian being and to live within this other being, this being which cannot fly, this being which is, the pace of this being is so different than that of the winged ones. And imagine that tree feeling the warmth, the 96 to 104 Fahrenheit, the warmth within, just imagine that. So more to say, and you can go to my website, Apis. And I re, I, you know, Laura likes to play with words too. So I named, I renamed the Latin Apis mellifera for honeybees into Apis arborea, the one who lives in trees. And that's the name of the website, apisarborea.com. Um, more to say, but, you know, I, the thought crossed my mind, oh, we all, our companions, just like trees and bees. We live in each other's hearts, whether we know it or not, but we do. Um, and that's where it's so beautiful to come together, to remind each other of that reality, that we are within each other's hearts and this larger heart all the time. And bees and those majestic trees, the tree of life, uh, are calling, have, have been calling for millennia and will never cease uh, to, to say it in Laura's words, to sing, to hum this melody of home, of sing the song of life and to dance, to dance this life, whatever it may be. 
We are coming to the end, Laura, and everybody else. May I just offer one more thing? Of course. Um, what I really love about what Mikhail is doing is very controversial in the larger scheme of the beekeeping world, but is very, um, it's like I feel that he's answering this deep language of the bee of really understanding who she is in her, in her natural state, her truest form without human intervention. And I'd say that the College of the Melissa, it, it, um, although we don't practice a tree beekeeping per se, um, what we're really interested in doing is uh, the same thing and then also accessing the relationship I'm, I'm not saying you're not doing that, Michael, but our focus is really on accessing that relationship, um, you know, just to learn more about our connections with nature. So I'd love to invite you, Jacob and Tiago and uh, Lisa Diane to class uh, on Tuesday. The rest of this group is already familiar with the class. So email with me if you're interested and maybe we could just take one moment to do a little humming, a little Brahmery humming um Michael, yeah let's do that yeah how about if we turn off our microphones mikhail so that um everybody can do it with their own sound and i'll just teach you brahmery um is the um, sound of the bee and if for those of you that don't know this meditation sound you put your tongue on the roof of your mouth and you you make your hands in the mantra maria showing how you roll your forefinger into the base of your uh, thumb and then you put your thumb and your middle finger together and that's the flower and the bee and that's the hand mudra and you leave your eyes just slightly open and let's do three and I'll turn off my microphone I'll do one so you know the sound with gratitude to the great apian being and the conduit to the mother earth herself let us our voices fill the void where bees are missing and let our hearts do the service of the bee on this earth i give thanks for the opportunity to share apian space with these brothers and sisters here today and i give thanks that so many people are listening to the bee May our pollinator species flourish and continue to inspire and teach humanity as a whole with an in right relation to Gaia. And happy day, Gaia. May you be well served today and every day, all days, for all time. And give thanks. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Thank you. And may the merit of our gathering be going everywhere into all the 10 directions and serve all beings. Thank you. And thank you very much for coming and spending an hour together. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Merci. <laughs> Merci.